Welcome to the very first episode of Learning Matters, the podcast where we do a deep dive into the world of learning and development. I'm Doug Woldridge, and I'm super excited to kick off this journey with a very special guest. She's a corporate instructional designer turned entrepreneur, visionary, and author with over 25 years of experience in the learning and development industry. She's been featured in publications such as Training Industry, Chief Learning Officer, and ATD, solidifying her status as a thought leader in instructional design and adult learning. When this episode comes out, it will mark 23 years for the business she built into the powerhouse it is today. So without further ado, we welcome Debbie Woldridge, CEO and founder of TTC Innovations to the podcast. Let's get to the interview. We want to welcome to the podcast, Debbie Woldridge. First off, I just want to thank you for agreeing to be our first guest on the podcast. I know your schedule is a little packed these days, uh, so thank you for coming on. And I'd like to take this opportunity for you to tell us a story of how you went from working as a corporate instructional designer to becoming the founder and CEO of TTC Innovations. <laughs> well, awesome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. No pressure being the first guest. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but hell, it's, that's great. I'm excited uh, and thrilled to um, have this opportunity to just have a dialogue and talk about uh, how how people get to wherever they're going on their journey. So Definitely. happy to share my journey. Don't know whether or not it will resonate with other people, but it, <laughs> I think it, but will. it is my I, story. I think our <laughs> listeners are in for a very good story here. So can we start with what got you into corporate learnings, uh, the corporate learning space uh, just to begin with? Mm. So. So, yeah, actually, I had zero background in instructional design <laughs> and zero understanding of adult learning. Um, I came out of college with a background in early childhood education, and uh, my degree was in business management for child care organizations, and all of my early career was around building a not-for-profit child care organization for school-age kids. Um, and one of the things that, that I think is important for people to know is, is that child care uh, is so important, but it is so underfunded. And that was the problem, is, is that I was consistently trying to find funds to run the organization, to keep enough teachers available for the kids, to make a really good environment um, for the kids. And so that required grant writing, which <laughs> I also had zero background in, but um, as one does, when, <laughs> you just kind of do what you need to do. And for the longest time, the uh, grants were for playground equipment, um, supplies, sure. um, things for the kids. And that was great. Um, but Federal legislation changed, the president changed, and the focus on what they were willing to fund changed. And all of a sudden, they didn't fund things that were specifically for the kids anymore, mm. and instead focused the funding around adult education and preparing people to be better at working with the kids, which is honestly a really good idea because you can overcome a bad environment with children, but you cannot overcome a bad teacher in a classroom. Wow. So Very well I think put. the federal government was smart in making that change. But for me, it threw me a curveball because I knew <laughs> nothing about how to train <laughs> teachers. Um, you know, so I thought, well, okay, no problem. Uh, so I wrote a grant uh, request and I asked for a lot of money to fund a certification program. I don't know why I thought this was smart, but I did. Um, <laughs> that we would create a certification program for all school-age child care providers for the state of Kansas. Wow. School-age child care is something that is not really recognized as frequently as, like, the, there's a lot of preschool education certification programs. Mm -hmm. And so, and my, my child care facility was school-age child care. So I thought, well, this is something that doesn't exist, so why not? <laughs> so I submitted the grant, and I figured nothing. Um, and for whatever reason, the federal government decided that this was a smart idea. And they agreed to it, and they funded it. So what were you able to do with that uh, grant money, ultimately? Well... The problem is, is they funded it, and I didn't know how to build training. <laughs> so uh, I reached out to 
the community college, the Kansas City, Kansas Community College, early childhood department, they had a really great, really strong leader. Um, the woman's name that was in charge of the program was Betty, and she was fantastic. Mm. Um, she just was so open-minded, and I called her up, and I said, you don't know me, <laughs> um, but I've heard of you, and, and I've, I've been to a couple of um, training classes that you've run, and I just got this big grant from the federal government, and I don't know how to build this. Would you partner? So she kindly said yes, and so I met with her, and because the funding had a lot to do with... Um, building this certification program, and it was doing video pieces, components, um, and then it also required me to travel across the state and deliver the training program mm -hmm. once it was built. So it was a very short window. We had to build all of this. So she brought on the media team. She worked with me to write out scripts. Um, we created a eight different courses, and each of the courses had a different vignette. We had a, um, a magic theme. <laughs> we had a detective series. Um, we just tried to change things up. We did a game show series. We did um, a, a, a video that had like an interview kind of thing. We tried to do like an Oprah moment. Yeah. Um, anyway, it was, it was <laughs> low ball. It was, uh, you know, uh, bless the heart of the media team over at the community college. I'm sure that they were just overwhelmed with my lack of <laughs> right. experience. Oh my gosh. But they did great. And they, 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 we built this. <laughs> and what year was this? Oh my gosh. I can't even believe you're asking me that. Um, <laughs> I don't remember the exact year. It was like in the late 1990s. So probably like 97, 98. Right. Um, so, I mean, it, it, this was a ways back and E-learning was not a thing back then. So we literally created video cassettes <laughs> and we printed workbooks. And so um, we had this series, it was eight modules. And what we would do is go into a location and we partnered with um, the local community health departments so that they could pull together and provide as a facility. We paid, it was all paid for by this grant, um, the facility food, bringing in all the child care providers in the community, all of the marketing materials. Again, this was like this big, massive initiative that I had no experience in any of it, but <laughs> right. it worked for whatever reason. I, it, the thing is, is that nobody knew what to expect. And so whatever we did was fine because nobody had really any expectations of what this would look like. And with that in mind, what was the response to folks first uh, delving into this training? How did they respond to you know, this type of awesome. interactivity? When, when they came to the first session, um, ironically, um, my brother was working for me as, at the time. He was my secretary of the organization, <laughs> collecting, you know, doing all the accounts receivables mm -hmm. and all of that for me, um, doing some computer work for me. That's kind of his bag. I, I forced him to go with me to do the facilitation because there was just, I, I wanted to be able to focus on the training session and needed somebody to kind of pass things out, make sure everybody was comfortable, answer questions, get water, whatever. Um, so he traveled the state of Kansas with me. Um, <laughs> we went to our first session and 25 people showed up for it. And the thing that they said when they walked in the door and we had some introducing yourselves was the fact that they had never had an opportunity to attend training for school for their school age kids. So they were super excited because they had taken a lot of preschool training classes, um, but nobody had really helped them really focus on how to deliver good child care for school age kids. Wow. And it's not just preschool on steroids. I mean, school age kids have unique needs. They have different physical abilities, they have different emotional experiences, different social experiences, and and giving them training to help them be successful, what was this uplifting experience and, and just an amazing year long. So we, it, we spent like three and a half, four months building the training, and then I spent a year traveling the state delivering the training <laughs> on the weekends. So we would go out, we would deliver a full day session, the attendees would then take the modules and the state, pr the funding included printing of all the workbooks for all the, the attendees. Um, we would deliver the workbooks to them the, and they would get the video cassettes. Um, so they'd go finish the, the home, all the homework and it would be the eight modules. I would send them um, 
a little piece of information kind of midway through to make sure that they were doing okay through their community health department. I would send them like check-ins, you know, mm -hmm. how are you doing? How are things going? And then at the end of the series, we went back and they had, we did an assessment of them when they, when they completed it to make sure that they had taken the information and were able to do something that they had actually completed the course. And then we had these beautiful certificates that uh, <laughs> John had created for them. And they were, they were really, it looked great for 1998 <laughs> 99. I mean, really, um, you know, things that were not as, as they are today. So those certificates looked great and we yeah. framed them I and mean, we, we had good funding for this. Um, so it was just that. And all of a sudden what I realized is, is that while I loved working in child care, this triggered this moment where when I was in front of these people in the audience who were suddenly so moved by having somebody care to make them better at what they love to do. And that was the moment when I realized, you know, there, there's something bigger out there, something different that I want to do in my career. Um, but that's a big jump to say, oh, I'm going to <laughs> suddenly become an instructional designer. I'm going to become... Actually, I didn't even know the term. I didn't know... Was the term was even out there at that time? I mean, maybe, <laughs> yes, I think so, but, but I didn't know anything. I didn't even know training departments existed. Right. I had no knowledge of the corporate world at all. However, take into, I think it was like uh, 1999, yes, um, I saw an ad in the paper for an instructional designer for La Petite Academy, which is was at the time the largest for-profit child care center. Mm -hmm. So I was, so I thought, God, this is like meant for me because here's this corporate job that wanted me to write training for their child care workers. And so um, that was kind of that defining moment of where and I left not-for-profit and, and took that passion and moved into corporate America. Um, corporate America being, uh, you know, a child care corporation. Sure. But it, it definitely was that point that brought me into the world. And that's when I learned that there were jobs called instructional designers. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. So uh, you've gone from the nonprofit area now into the for-profit. And what was your job title at La Petite? What, what was that job that you were actually applying for? So I was applying for it officially. The job was called instructional designer. Um, so I went in for an interview and um, I met with the director of training um, and she was asking me about all of my experience. And so I tried to make the eight modules that I had built with you know, the unit with the, the community college sounds like this really a lot of hefty <laughs> training, this two and two year project uh, funded by the federal government, you know, and she hired me, <laughs> um, which, yeah, uh, so uh, when I, um, I had to do a 30 day notice uh, because I was executive director mm -hmm. of this not for profit, I had this board and on it, I had started this not for profit. Yeah. So this was this was my baby and to suddenly say I'm going to leave this and move on to something else um, I wanted to give them a nice notice so I gave them 30 days I helped them find the new executive director I did some training with that person um, and stayed on call with them for a little bit um, so I didn't start work until about 30 days after I had received the job offer hmm. and I showed up to work the first day and they told me when they when I walked in that the director of training had just left two days before. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I was oh, now no. <laughs> So now I take on this brand new job that first of all I had no idea what an instructional designer was supposed to do on a daily basis. Um, but I took on this job and and I didn't have a direct supervisor. She was gone. <laughs> they assured me that they were going to be hiring to replace her. Um, but in the meantime, they sat me at a cubicle and, and showed me my desk and you know, showed me some of the training materials that they had for some of their people and gave me a course that they wanted that was supposed to be my first assignment to build. And they also said, by the way, we also have a temp here who's going to help because you need to be doing all the registration of all the people for all the training courses because states have requirements mm -hmm. for continuing education for their child care providers and their early childhood staff. And so we need, the department is responsible for tracking all of that <laughs> compliance. And so um, 
We don't really have an employee to do that, so we've brought in a temp to help for a couple of weeks. And here's uh, Dana Huffstedler. This is who you're going to be working with. And by the way, you need to manage her because <laughs> we don't really have anybody else in charge of this. There's no director of training, so can you make sure that she, got, that she has what she needs? Um, so I took on the job of instructional designer, no idea what that meant, and also became a manager to the training department administrator, who was a temp. <laughs> <clears throat> and so is there a moment during that first like two days where you got into your office and closed the door and you're just like, I am way in over my head here? Well, one, I didn't have an office. I had a cubicle, which I never even, I had, I had heard people talk about working in cubicles and I knew that this was a thing, um, but I never envisioned myself to be in a cubicle, <laughs> but it was. So I'm sitting in my cubicle and I think it was like maybe four hours into my day. And I remember staring at my computer and I kept hitting the enter button because I didn't know. There was nothing to do. Like I had my email program open. I expected to come in and just have this wall of stuff that I was supposed to do. And, and so I kept hitting enter thinking, why is my email not coming in? Maybe, maybe <laughs> oh, no. something. No. So I just sat there and I realized nobody's going to tell me what to do. I've got to figure this out. So I got up and I started introducing myself to other people <laughs> in the cubicles. <laughs> and um, I, I did have an opportunity to meet the person who was in charge, the director of curricula. Mm -hmm. So she was in charge of writing and developing all the curriculum that was going to be delivered to the children. I was supposed to train the people to deliver that curriculum. Right. So I thought, oh, good, I'll talk with her, and she'll tell me what I'm supposed to do. She had no idea what I was supposed to do, but she knew <laughs> I was supposed to do something. Um, so we talked about what was going to be rolling out in the next quarter, and so I thought, okay, well, I'll write, a, I'll write a training program to introduce this to the staff. So I sat down and started right and stuff. And, and I scurriedly looking through all the different um, stuff that was in the director of training's office, because she had an office. Mm -hmm. and it was a nice office. The door was shut. So <laughs> I went <laughs> in there and poked around in all of her cabinets and her files and tried to find stuff. I found the template um, and it was out on a shared drive. So, which I, all of this was new to me. We basically used an accounting program and an email program at the child care agency. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were not for profit. We didn't have anything fancy. Right. Um, so <laughs> I get on here and there's like Microsoft Word and um, very old versions of Microsoft <laughs> Word and, and a shared drive. So I'm hunting around the shared drive and realizing I'm probably not supposed to be accessing some <laughs> of these files, but I mean, you got to find what you got to find. Look, so, sometimes you I, need to just take the initiative and go find what right. you need to learn. You just got to do it. So, yeah. So that was how my first week started at uh, my new role as instructional designer. <laughs> Fast forward about a month later, they realized they weren't going to hire anybody, or they hadn't found anybody. Mm -hmm. So they came to me and said, hey, <laughs> how would you like to take on the department and be the training manager? Um, so <laughs> wouldn't that be great? <laughs> so I said, sure. What was your thought, though, when they, when they came to you? When you, when they first you know, walked in and said, "Hey, Debbie, um, got a proposition for you here. What do you think about taking on this department that is kind of in flux right now, as is?" <laughs> in flux is a very kind word for what it was, <laughs> but you know, honestly, I was so relieved um, because when I. I, I I started the not-for-profit agency. I had a board of directors. We met with them once a month. I reported to them once a month. Hmm. But there was nobody over my shoulder telling me what to do on a daily basis. I think had I come into the job and that director of training would have still been there, I think I would have really struggled because hmm. – I think it's not within my nature to work that closely under somebody's supervision. I'm not really great at um, waiting for somebody to tell me what to do. I kind of <laughs> just do. And I don't know that that's necessarily the best employee type <laughs> to be. So, <laughs> so I don't know that I would have been the department head's favorite employee <laughs> because I think I just do. And so for me, it was a big sense of relief because I felt more comfortable with that. 
Because then I felt like, okay, now I can shape this department. I can, I can do what I think needs to happen. And, and I had been doing a lot of interviewing with, um, they had area vice presidents, vice presidents who were responsible for big sections. And these were, these people answered right to the CEO. So these were important people in the organization. And I had got to spend a lot of time with them in this first month, meeting with them because they were in the corporate offices. They had, we were in the middle of a CEO change <laughs> in the organization. And so they were there and I had used that opportunity to meet with them and talk with them about what was going on in their areas and what were the, some of the challenges and the problems that their staff were facing. And so I was gathering a lot of really good information. And what I didn't know that that was called is analysis. I had no <laughs> idea. <laughs> I thought I was just asking them a lot of annoying questions. These are your first but subject I, matter experts here. The, exactly so. Okay. So what I uncovered during my analysis is there was a lot of need. Um, and, and it was this really great natural learning progression for my own experience as an instructional designer. That's crazy. So ultimately, there's just... Uh, from the start, there's massive changes going on in this uh, mm -hmm. company, and uh, not only did your original manager not be there during the uh, beginning, you're also having a brand new CEO come in. So mm -hmm. what is it like dealing with that type of chaos of a company going through a reorg? I, I tell you, um, it was, for me, the most impactful experience, and, and unfortunately not in a good way, mm. um, because what was happening with the organization is they had had a CEO who had been with the company for a really long time, and he was super committed to the children and the families that he serviced. He was so committed to the employees, and it was this very warm and welcoming environment that I interviewed for. Yeah. And my first couple of weeks were this warm and welcoming experience, and, and people made me feel very comfortable very fast, which was great because new person, no manager, I needed that type of support. And then the winds changed, and he retired, and they brought in a new CEO, the board uh, of that um, for-profit agency, brought in a new CEO with the purpose of making the company more profitable, hmm. more efficient. Um, and, and there are CEOs who are hired specifically to go from company to company to company, and their job is to come in here, create change, make all kinds of different strategies, do an, an efficiency audit, and then implement a lot of change, and then they move on, mm -hmm. and then they bring in a new CEO. So it, it was a very planned experience that the board had put into play. The problem is, is this is an organization uh, company that is supporting people. Right. The output of what they're doing is taking care of people's most important possessions, their children. Mm -hmm. And so... When the leadership of that organization doesn't represent the level of service, care, and nurture, you have a lot of chaos happening. And in some companies and in some structures, that chaos might be good. It might be the fire to light people up. Um, in this situation, it definitely was not. But there was one shining light that happened out of that in that the new CEO brought in a vice president of human resources, Patty Powell, <laughs> my all-time favorite person in the whole universe. And, and if I could ever aspire to be so great, I would be Patty Powell in my, my next life. <laughs> She's this amazing person. Um, she came in with the new CEO and she um, sat in and, and really took the time to get to know me, got to know my vision of what I wanted to do with the training department. Um, and, and ironically, one of the things that I had to do as training department was to send everybody to this executive leadership back to nature moment kind of thing. I'm sure you've very you know, there's these retreat centers. Okay. You actually go up into the mountains. You stay in a cabin. It's very rustic. There's no email. There's no phone service. This sounds right and my up job my alley. 
Yeah, you wouldn't enjoy it. <laughs> so um, my job was to book people into this, and I had to organize them based on, there was a tiered level of who who was expected to go. So, you know, first tier was the CEO and, and the VP levels, mm -hmm. um, the area VPs, they all went as this first group. And then I was scheduling the next group, and I was supposed to be in the next group, but I was busy. <laughs> so I didn't, <laughs> did, I wasn't able to schedule myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I kept putting my name further and further down the list. But anyway, they come back from this retreat, and um, I could see some differences in Patty. And we, did, we had a couple of conversations that were really great. Um, she was, stayed very positive, and she, she shared, you know, her goal was to really make the human resource department a really great place mm. that would support the organization. Um, and I was inspired and thinking, this is going to be really good. It'll be fine. We'll manage through this. And then a few weeks later, she announced she was leaving. Oh, wow. And that this retreat experience had given her an opportunity to reflect on her life. And what she realized is, is that she didn't belong in a corporate change mm -hmm. organization yeah. and that she really wanted to spend time just helping companies be successful in their human resources. And so she decided to become a consultant. Wow. And she left. <laughs> I think that takes a ton of bravery to mm -hmm. uh, have mm -hmm. those moments of clarity and then act on them. Uh, I th exactly so. Exactly so. And uh, when after she left, the new person that came in, the new vice president came in for human resources, and she couldn't have been more opposite. <laughs> she was the anti-Patty. <laughs> 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 it was uh, bizarro, it was Patty. Just it was exactly. It was couldn't have been more different. Um, and we we managed through a few months. We were doing some really good things in the training department. I was I was proud of the work I was mm -hmm. doing. Um, I really felt successful in the work that I was doing. I actually talked the CEO into uh, agreeing to bring Dana on as an an actual employee oh, because she was very a temp. cool. And so I, I convinced them that, that I needed her as an employee partner. And so she, we converted her from <laughs> temp to hire. And, and I brought her in. And, and her and I really, we bonded. We developed a lot of stuff. She was a risk taker just like me. She was so wide open to, let's try it. I mean, why not? <laughs> um, and we were clicking, doing some really good things. But there were still so much culture things that I wasn't enjoying about the company. So if what what I would do, and they did, by the way, move me into the office. So I went from Cubeland into that <laughs> office when they promoted me. I forgot to say that. So I did get an office. Um, but then I moved Dana in because I, and I just shared that it was really important for her and I to have the ability to communicate privately because we were talking about learning experiences and people's in how they were doing it with their learning. Yeah. I don't know how I sold this. It was <laughs> it sounded good at the time. But anyway, they moved her desk into my office so we could shut the door and just kind of shut everything out and just work heads down and yeah. and create training and plan events for people who were working in the company. Mm -hmm. So And I assume that this is really the catalyst for the lifelong friendship. Uh, professional friend, mm -hmm. uh, working relationship that you have together um, with Dana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dana Hofstadler became Dana Jansen, <laughs> <laughs> who is now, uh, and, and I am thrilled um, that, that we've had so many years of experience, and she's, she's with me here, making TTC happen. Um, so anyway, um, around, I don't know, probably five or six months later, after Patty had left, I got a phone call. And it was Patty. And she said, hey, Debbie, how are you doing? How are things going? And she just kind of shared a little bit about what she was doing. And she goes, you know, I have this really exciting gig that I'm working. Um, and there are some human resource things that I'm working on with them. But one of the things that they have is a problem in their training. <laughs> so, hey, if you know anybody just like you <laughs> that might be looking for a consulting gig, I have a three-month contract. Um, so, you know, just if you know anybody like you, that would be interested, that would be great. She told me a little bit about it, and I, we talked for a little bit more, and as she hung up, she goes, you know, if you think of anybody just like you, mm -hmm. give me a call right away. <laughs> I love the subtlety here. I right, love it. <laughs> so we hung up. I went home, and um, I talked to my husband, who was in the garage, and I, he was fiddling around with go-karts, because that was his passion. Um, <laughs> and we were chatting, and I told him, hey, 
Patty called me and shared with me about this opportunity for me to, somebody like me, to take this three-month consulting gig. And he looked at me and he said, are you nuts? Why would you? <laughs> you're not seriously considering that. You have a great, you have a full-time job. You're making more money than you've ever made in your life. And it's pretty low pressure. Um, you just got a raise. You just got a new <laughs> job title. You're good, right? And I said, no. <laughs> I really think I'm interested in this. And he said, I don't think for our family this is the right thing to do. And he gave me a lot of really, really good feedback. Great feedback. The next day, I went back to the office, picked up the phone, called Patty, and said, hey, Patty. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I'd really, really like to take this on. Um, who do I need to connect with to interview for this? Um, she connected me. I interviewed, got accepted for the consulting gig, and came back and quit my job. <laughs> so. so what made you take that leap of faith um, after, you know, I'm sitting on it for roughly like 12 to 16 hours and being like, all right, I'm doing this. What, um, you know, what was it something in just the way that you felt about how things were going at La Petite or was it just, I need to make a transition in my life. And I think that this could be that transition. You know, I, maybe a little bit of all of that. Um, I knew I wasn't happy. I knew that, um, I had a vision for where the training department could go at La Petite, and the CEO was not interested in following that vision. Fine, I mean, she was CEO of the company. That, that's her decision to make. Mm -hmm. um, but I struggled with it because I knew that um, maybe I didn't have all the answers, but I certainly knew the questions that I was asking were demonstrating to me that we weren't giving hmm. the employees the support they needed. And it was frustrating to me because I felt like there was so much more we could do. So, and I also didn't love the culture. Um, when I first started, it was such a very different culture. In such a short time, it flipped to this, this focus on profits, this focus on efficiency, um, how do we make our name so big. I mean, all of this rebranding that was going on, it was as if we threw everything out that was so good and that attracted me um, to this new environment. And it was almost as if this was this moment changing, this changing moment in my life where it was like, jump in, all in, or stay. Mm -hmm. And I decided to jump. <laughs> so, you know, when I thought, worst case, you know, here's the thing. I could go get a job somewhere else. I know I can get a job somewhere else. And that's what I told my husband that night when I went home was... Uh, oh, yeah. Let's go back <laughs> to that. What was his thoughts <laughs> when you came home that night? Was he like, uh, 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 all right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I think I said it really nicely. I think I, I said something about, you know, this is an, uh, an opportunity of a lifetime. It's great money for three months. Um, <laughs> it's going to be wonderful. And I'm going to come back and get a job and I'll be so much. He knew that I was not happy right. with what I was doing. Um, I, I was happy with what I was trying to accomplish, mm. but I felt like I was hitting walls all the time. And so um, he knew that, and plus his heart. I mean, after he had his opportunity to have a say, but once I told him I was going for it, then he was like, great, let's do it. All right. Let's make it happen. That's the type of support everyone needs is yeah, a partner absolutely. that's able to come in and be like, you know what? Follow your dreams. Let's, let's make totally. it happen. We will make it work. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you had three months nailed down as a freelance yep. instructional designer. You had that looking mm -hmm. at you. Uh, we're, I know we just kind of discussed it a little bit. And while you, I'm, I'm sure that you were confident in the fact that you could come get another job, was there anything there in the back of your mind like, oh boy, did I make this right decision? You know, y no. I, yeah, I never thought it wouldn't work. Never. I love that. I never confidence. thought it wouldn't work. I love it at all. <laughs> um, you know, because I don't, I don't really have uh, these moments where I'm like, oh, I have to have this or I have to have that. Um, I'm kind of a fly by the seat of my pants kind of person. So, <laughs> I, in fact, thinking through and planning out where. I see myself six months from now is probably a weakness for me. I'm not great at that, which 
as a CEO of this company, it can be a challenge because <laughs> while in my head I have a strategy, putting it on paper is a challenge for me. And so, you know, back in those days, it was, it was I never thought that there wouldn't, that it wouldn't work. So I'm a big believer in a, things are going to work out, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with mm -hmm. good, <laughs> you know, with good vibes or at least a commitment to, uh, continued hard working, something good's going to come out of this. So we'll just see what happens at the end of the show. So while you were working this three month contract, you were on location in Ohio, correct? Yep. Columbus, Ohio. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So how did you deal with the pressures of spending multiple weeks of a month away from your family? So it was what, three weeks on one week off? E exactly. So yeah, it, that I think was probably I loved everything about what I was doing except for that mm. because I had never spent that much time away um, from my family ever. I mean, I had done a couple of work trips, you know, short weekend kind of things, but um, this was very different. Mm. And um, this was in 2001. And so, you know, there just wasn't communicate. I didn't have like a cell phone with me mm -hmm. all the time. I didn't, you know, they're just, technology was not the same. I mean, I had a, an actual phone in a hotel room. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, communication and, and scheduling for, for my family, uh, w was a super challenge and, and there were ups and downs. There were a lot of good things. I think it was great because my husband got to spend a lot of time being Mr. Mom, <laughs> um, and doing, you know, those kind of, of roles where, uh, while he was working a full-time job, um, and we had good childcare, we had good support. Um, so, you know, at, at the time it seemed to work, but here's where things go sideways a little bit because, you know, when you are the primary person taking care of your kids, you take them to school, you take them to daycare, you go to your job, you pick them up from daycare, you go home to work, you know, you do dinner, whatever, you get into these routines. Mm -hmm. All of that was out the window because my husband was not the primary caregiver of the kids for their first few and kids, you, um, Me. was not the primary <laughs> caregiver uh, of, of you and your sister. And so the, the bottom line was, is that there were a lot of mistakes. And I remember, um, I was in a meeting, um, on site in Columbus and I get this urgent phone call to the center. Um, and it was a call center. And, and I, they said, you, you've got to take this call. And I was like, who's calling oh my me gosh. here? So, so I pick up the phone and it's my sister. <laughs> I'm like, why, why are you calling me? I'm at work. <laughs> and she goes, yeah, I'm notifying you that your children were left at school and then there's a no school day because it snowed. And the school had to call me because I'm your emergency contact. <laughs> I'm at work. I can't pick your kids up. Could you get a hold of Chris and tell him to pick your kids up? So he didn't know that, you know, school gets canceled occasionally and he didn't know <laughs> to check the weather reports and he dropped the kids off. And this actually happened more than once during, Look, <laughs> during this experience. It was, it was a great growing experience for Jessica and I. Ultimately, we get to have that wonderful moment uh, with her children where we get to go, well, back in our day, we used to walk to school even if we didn't have school in the right. snow. Uphill, both ways. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah. So, you know, there were little glitches like that, but uh, but we made it work. We made it work. And, and, you know, and then when I would come home for the one week, I, I was still heads down, though, because I was having to write. Yeah, I would spend three weeks sitting doing side by sides at the call center, mm -hmm. watching the activities, um, hear, listening in on the phones to hear how the customer service reps were interacting with customers. And then, um, because I was rewriting a new hire training program wow. for them. So then I would come home and I'd spend a week, you know, just heads down writing, um, and then go back. And was that your first experience really working from home there or were you working in yeah. Uh, you were working no, from home I, during that time. You're just during the week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was so weird not <laughs> to go to an office because I had spent my entire career up until this point in an office mm -hmm. somewhere. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I didn't even have any. I didn't even have 
a desk. I had no workspace, so I was on my living room couch, and I would have like piles of paper and this humongous laptop. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine what laptops were like in, in tw- 2001. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, my internet was a phone cord. It was plugged into the phone, and you had that yep. noise that you get <laughs> when you were signing into dial-up. But I didn't have a phone near where I was working, so we had like this 50-foot phone cord that you could that was plugged into the telephone. We'd have to unhook the phone from the (laughs) phone cord and plug in my computer so that I could get online. And no one could make a phone call in or out of the house. Nobody. No, and and if you guys, (laughs) if it had a snow day, we would not know. They would have to call my sister because you could not dial in because you'd get a busy tone. Very funny. So. You've <laughs> you've finished these first three months uh, working with, I believe the company Submit Order, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So the company was Submit Order, and it was at the beginning, um, they formed at the beginning of the dot-com era. Mm-hmm. And their job, was, they brought um, companies, they managed all the customer service of all of the companies online ordering, which was all new. I mean, back then, this was a very new thing. And the the client that they were working for to improve customer service was Kmart's bluelight.com. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And so I was writing all of the new hire training for (laughs) bluelight.com. So I was learning all of Kmart's processes and procedures, all of the the stuff. And the job of the customer services was when people placed an order on bluelight.com. Dot com, <laughs> then they would call and, and have issues or whatever. I mean, you know, the internet was not what it is today. Right. So I can just imagine was, chaos in the shipping centers right? oh my and just goodness, with customers yeah. being like, I just got, I, I ordered this and I got this. Uh, right. I imagine that happened mm-hmm. all the time. All the time. Which mm-hmm. I would also imagine would mean that the training was constantly evolving. So is that yeah. ultimately what led you you to sticking on for a much longer contract than the first three months? Yes. So what happened is, is I delivered the training for bluelight.com and, and we ran a couple of new hire classes. And, and so I sat in the back, they had a facilitator that worked for the company and, and I had to go to Florida to, to watch the classes and take notes, make changes, adjust the curriculum based on what I was seeing with the new hire interactions. Um, but within the first couple of months of deployment, they had such a dramatic increase in speed to proficiency of the new hires that were taking part in this new curriculum. When I first got there and what they were doing before they brought me on board was they had purchased some off the shelf customer service training. Mm -hmm. It was okay. It had talked about how to speak nicely, how to be empathetic to the customer. The problem is this had nothing to do with bluelight.com. So, you know, I took those basic customer service principles, but then I embedded in the culture of of, of Kmart's bluelight.com. And so when the new hires got promoted and worked on the floor, the time for them to have side-by-sides was decreased by almost two weeks right away. And then their, their, so the proficiency was immediately wow. impacted in, in demonstration. <laughs> but then I think that that is... Um, I'm a great instructional designer. (laughs) (laughs) It's not that. Honestly, it's when you build training that is relevant and is relatable and immediately usable, you become better as an employee quicker. And that's what they got with the custom learning solution that I built for them. And so... What happened then is Submit Order was a, was the housing firm for all of these, but they had other clients that were using their call centers. And so they then brought me on to Dix.com. Um, and what was the most cool, though, was that, and this is where my daughter Jessica thought I was just became the cool mom, <laughs> was when I got to do Limited 2. Oh, so, my gosh. <laughs> that's Blast from the right. past. So, Right? So I brought home, when I would come home, I would bring home all of these manuals that had limited to logo. All She was thrilled. She so was thrilled that, at the, was cool. the least interesting swag that you could possibly bring into. That's awesome. <laughs> Just anything that had the brand right. name on it. I love it. The yeah, logo. exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. So I ended up working for all of their logos mm-hmm. then, and I rewrote all of their training. Um, many of the pieces were convertible that I could take from, that I built from Blue Light 
Ruby-Light.com, and then I would customize it for each specific company mm -hmm. and their culture, their organization. Um, and it was super effective. It was a lot of fun. It was something completely out of the box for me. So, But you mentioned distribution. And that's where this chapter went next, is because the um, once we got done with the call center, they um, said, hey, you know, we have problems over in the distribution center <laughs> because Submit Order also owns the distribution centers. Mm -hmm. So I got my first glance behind the scenes of a distribution center, and it was fascinating. I mean, these machines just bringing stuff all over, and I learned terms like picker <laughs> and, <laughs> and how important the job of the picker is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they brought me over to the distribution center, and that's where I met Lori Fry. <laughs> Um, she actually worked for Submit Order, and one of the reasons I was there doing the instructional design was because she was home. She had just had a baby and took a lot of time off to be with her, her daughter, and it was lovely for her and fantastic for me. But she came back to work, and we had an opportunity to meet, and, and so I partnered with her, and, and um, she was, in essence, my new boss there because you know she owned the training department mm -hmm. there for Submit Order. So who was who was ultimately in charge of the training department while she was gone? Was it you? You were kind of just sitting there, attempting to no, take that on, or no, not at all. Yeah. And I was focused only on instructional design. Um, Fran Watkins is the was the. Um, HR lead, and so she was just managing all of those components in Lori's absence. But gotcha. Lori would have been there doing the instructional design had she not had a baby. So it was kind of just magic that this happened because she would have been in there doing all of this had she not been on maternity leave. But because she was, it was this opportunity for me to step into this corporate world. So <laughs> very cool. You know, it was a real blessing. <laughs> uh, and she's just this amazing person. And um, not only did she work as, at Submit Order, but she also had her own company called Technically Right. And Technically Right was a contract house, and she had a group of technical writers and um, technical team members who she would farm out work to consultants to do that work. And it was kind of her side business, her side gig <laughs> um, that she ran. And so... And can you... Uh <clears throat> Let me rephrase this. <clears throat> um, can you give us a br ah, can you give us a brief rundown of kind of the difference between instructional design as opposed to technical writing? I yeah. In fact, it, it was super interesting because as Lori and I started having opportunities to have coffee together. We did that regularly whenever I was in Columbus. Um, we talked a lot about what she was doing with her technical writing firm and what we were doing, what I was doing as far as instructional design. And um, she shared that one of the challenges she had at Technically Write is that oftentimes companies would um, begin the contract with her looking for a user manual to be written, which is a lot of mm -hmm. things that technical writing are, you know, walk step by step processes. If you get, if, back in the day <laughs> when you would buy a new piece of equipment, it would come with an owner's manual and it would have all of these, you know, user guides. Or if you bought new software, you'd get a user guide. Um, so technical writers do a lot of that kind of work. They do a lot of job aids, um, a lot of process documentation. And then what would happen is, is they would, especially these companies that were implementing new systems, they would get the user manual and realize that there was still a gap for their employees. So they would have the information on step by step, but there was no correlation between how did this how did I then use that to do my job? Mm -hmm. And so they would ask her, you know, what kind of support can you do? Mm -hmm. And my contract at the distribution center was wrapping up. And so she said, hey, I have a company that is really looking for more of a training ant solution versus a technical solution. Would you be interested in contracting with me and with my company? Um, and so that's how I connected with Technically Right. <laughs> and I became their one instructional designer. So all of the other team members there were technical writers or technical documentarians um, and, or page layout people as well. And then they, there was me. Sounds like a perfect partnership. Help. Right? Yeah, yeah, it worked great. <laughs> Wonderful. And um, 
at what point uh, did you transition from doing uh, contract work with Submit Order into doing uh, leading seminars for Fred Pryor? Mm -hmm. So as my work was was coming to an end with the distribution center, um, I realized, gosh, i got to find my next gig. <laughs> and while Lori had reached out to me, the work that I was going to do for her was really small. Um, it wasn't going to pay the bills. Right. How many hours were so, you able to work in those initial days? Oh, I was working, gosh, probably 50, 60, 80 hour weeks. I mean, I was booking a lot of time. Wow. Um, and it was great because, you know, we, but here's what I didn't realize though, is, is that, you know, when you're a consultant, you get this really great hourly rate, but nobody's paying your taxes. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned all about the fact that you got to pay your own taxes. And so, you, you know, and you don't have benefits. And if you're sick, you don't get paid. If you don't show up to work, you don't get paid. Yep. Um, so there was a lot of those kind of lessons. Um, and, and it was fine. I, I was making really good. This this first contract was just was really a good one, and, and Chris was thrilled, <laughs> <laughs> unbelievably thrilled with how how good this contract was. But it came to an end, and I didn't want to go back to corporate America. I mm -hmm. I figured I could get a job because now I had some real good legit instructional design experience at a whole lot of different industries. Right. So I felt like that was an opportunity, but it was something that I didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wanted to find ways to keep doing the contracting because then I felt like I had some control over the kind of work that I did and the kind of companies that I worked for. Um, but I needed, I needed money too. So I um, saw an ad for Fred Pryor Seminars and they were headquartered in Kansas City, which was real convenient. Mm -hmm. um, so I went and I interviewed and God, the interview was intense. I mean, you had to... <laughs> You had to do first a face-to-face -face interview, and then you had to get on camera, and you had to deliver like 30 minutes of training wow. on a random topic. And I just, this is not my thing. I mean, I, I was so, so nervous. and so You I'm had facilitated sure before, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, with people. Right. There's a big <laughs> difference between interacting with people and interacting to a camera. Gotcha. So, <laughs> this is how I know Hollywood is not calling my name because I actually need people. <laughs> you, um, look, yeah, you're no. meant for the stage. I get it. <laughs> you got to have that interaction. Not, not, yeah, <laughs> it would have to be interactive plays. Yeah. Um, Anyway, I, I made it through, and they called me and said, hey, you made it. We're so excited to welcome you. Um, you need to come to this, like, two, I don't know, week or two-week training thing. Um you're not going to get paid for it, but you have to come to it. And, <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, you have to become a registered business. We want, you can't do this as a sole proprietor. Gotcha. Everything up until this moment, I had been a sole proprietor. Okay. So I l didn't know how to do that, but I found a, um, a website to the IRS, and it talked about how you file for a federal employer identification number, and I called the 1-800 number, and I... <laughs> filed and they're like what would your company name be and I was like what <laughs> I don't know <laughs> hadn't put that much thought DW into this training so and development. One, right? no I chose I was like DW training and development so um, awesome I, I was super clever but you know I was like it's me who cares um <laughs> anyway so I incorporated uh I got my letter of incorporation April 16th 2001. That's when the official DW training and development launched. Uh, it was a company of me. <laughs> and uh, I, I went to the uh, Fred Pryor training program. And by the way, they did a fantastic job. They really demonstrated what it was like to facilitate a really good program. They really knew their stuff. And mm -hmm. I, I enjoyed the training session tremendously. I really, um, they pushed you out of your comfort zone. Um, and in one of the activities that I was doing where I was being pushed out of my comfort zone, I met a fellow trainee, Keisha Dugan. Um, and we clicked immediately. We couldn't have had more, more different types of personalities. <laughs> and for whatever reason, we clicked. It was just dynamic from the get-go. She's this fabulously boisterous, energetic, enthusiastic, just... It, ball of fire. I'm a little bit more reserved. <laughs> but we played off each other and we had the best time 
getting to know each other during this training program. And because we were both newbies at the same time, our first week that we were sent out happened to be the same week. And at that time, the way Fred Pryor worked, because you were remote working, mm -hmm. you had a, a call-in, a phone mailbox. And so every day you would call in and you would report your numbers. How did your program go? How did things interact, any questions you had. But there was a calling tree of other people in the network from, that were part of Fred Pryor, because you could reach out to anybody for help, because people were delivering the same seminar all over. So you could call somebody else who was delivering customer service training and mm -hmm. ask questions or say, I got this question, can you help? And, P and everybody was super supportive of each other. It was a really a good first remote experience workforce. Um, Keisha and I shared each other's voicemail box, and so every night, we would call each other and leave each other these very long messages <laughs> about the funniest things that happened that day or the most, you won't believe this happened, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, and I remember leaving her this message about the fact that I, had t I got to a city and I, it w they were always at the hotel and so I went down to the conference room and it was one person, one person in the seminar. So oh I'm thinking, well, obviously this person's going to, you know, I call corporate office and, I'm like, and they're like, you can offer her, you know, a refund or you can offer her to come back another day. <laughs> and she says to me, no, I want the training today. Yes. I it today. So I delivered an eight hour training one on one with her and was legit there the entire <laughs> eight hours. I'm on the phone that night, and I'm sharing this with Keisha. The next night, I get to the next city, and I'm listening to my voice bell, and she's like, you won't believe this. I have a class <laughs> of 150. I was done in four hours. Oh, no. <laughs> and she'd sell it. I mean, she could get through that class <laughs> so fast, and people would never complain. They'd never be like, we paid for an eight-hour. She would just, and I'm like, oh, one person, eight <laughs> hours? <laughs> 150 people in four hours. But Man, talk about just, rolling out the red carpet for this person. That's, yeah, that's something special. Great. Wow. That Exactly. <laughs> the beautiful part about that, though, is, is that Keisha and I really formed this bond of, of professionals who are sharing kind of some of the same issues, but in a very different experience. Um, so... Um, that's how we, we became this, you know, the first there was Dana with La Petite and now Keisha with um, Fred Pryor Seminars. It's very exciting. It's so cool that <clears throat> uh, along this crazy road, you were able to meet um, some of our uh, most impactful folks that have been a part of the journey of TTC Innovations. So let's go back to Lori Fry. Uh, eventually uh -huh. she got a job with Bank of America. Is that correct? Yeah. So she was working for Submit Order. Um, and then at some point she had an opportunity or interviewed with Bank of America there in Columbus um, and got a great position with them. All this um, time between my time with Submit Order while I was working for Fred Pryor, she'd pitch me a few pieces of training development. So her and I were still in conversation. Mm -hmm. I was doing a few pieces with her. I would do the work at night, send it in during while I was um, doing the seminars. Or if that was my off week, then I would was available to meet with clients and, and do that work. So her and I stay connected throughout all of this time. So she shared with me that she was uh, taking a position with Bank of America and technically right, had a contract with Bank of America. So it was really a conflict of interest for oh, her. Yeah. She couldn't do both. <laughs> um, and she decided it was really in her best interest and it was an exciting opportunity to go join Bank of America. Um, so she at that point had a couple of options. She could shut down technically right, but she had some good clients that she had been doing, you know, some ongoing work with. Um, there were also several contractors who had been doing a lot of work with her for a long time, mm -hmm. including myself. <laughs> um, and so she, you know, decided instead of shutting the company down, then she'd go ahead and sell it. And she originally talked with um, the person who was doing her business development for her uh, and, and said, you know, do you want to buy the company? And um, 
that gal was like, yeah, you bet, I sure do. And then Lori was like, great, well, let's talk about um, a price point for this mm -hmm. and how, how that would work. And the business development person said, oh, no, I just thought I was just going to take it over. <laughs> All right. It's not really normally how you acquire not companies. Usually. <laughs> <laughs> not usually. Uh, so Lori said, thank you, no. Um, and she reached out to me and she said, you know, Debbie, she goes, you know, I've been working with contractors for quite some time and um, I just connect with you and I just think that this might be something that you might be interested in. And, you know, she said, you know, here, you know, I'd like to just talk with you about that. And um, so I said, okay, well, let's schedule some time. We can talk through what that would look like. I got off the phone and talked to Chris and... <laughs> told him that I was thinking about buying this company. He's and he's like, like again? I'm crazy. Another You're shift. nuts. <laughs> yeah, he said, you know, things are going really well. You don't have a lot of stress. You are traveling a lot, but there's not a tremendous amount of stress mm -hmm. in, in your world. If you buy a company, now you've got all of this other headache. And I said, I know. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> um, so I talked with Lori the next day. We came to terms that were equitable for both of us. And um, the one thing that we talked about was that um, while I know that there was a lot of business out there for technical writing and a good need for technical writing, it's really important. It's not my passion. Right. And so if I was taking the company on, I really felt like I was going to need to change the direction a little bit. And she said, you know... It's good. You do you do you, and 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 you know our clients are looking for both. So I don't think that that's going to be a problem. Right. Um, she said, "Now you can't use the name technically right, and <laughs> you know that that you know I'm not selling you the name of the company. I'm selling you the the business, the clients, the contractors." Mm -hmm. um, and then so I was like, "Okay, that's great." So hey. Now it's technically training. Uh, and because it was still the dot com, I thought it was so clever. <laughs> technically training dot com TTC. It looks was great cool. on a pen. <laughs> Doesn't it though? <laughs> yeah. So that's how, um, and that really happened um, in, uh, gosh, 2003. So I had been running the business for two years really as, a, as an individual. It was a corporation, mm -hmm. um, but I was really just, just me. And then in 2003, when I um, bought the company of Technically Right, became Technically Training, that's when we really became a business and I brought on contractors that had been part of that group. I also started building some of my own contractors because training was my area of interest. Mm -hmm. And this is how I had a wonderful opportunity to convince Keisha that she would be this amazing instructional designer as well. She had such a creative mind and she's so brilliant at knowing what people need uh, and how to get learners there. Um, and so she said, you know what, I've never done that. And I said, well, let's just do it. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I'll review your work. I'll, I'll fix it and make it instructionally sound or whatever. But, but Keisha, you're brilliant. Um, and so she took on one of my first projects, which was a Bank of America project, um, and helped me do some of the instructional design work for it. And, and gosh, that just really kicked off our relationship with Bank of America. I think that's one of the most impactful and inspiring aspects of what makes a great leader, is someone who is able to see the potential with the quiches of this world and be able to bring them under their wing and ultimately allow them to prosper and, and in all honesty, make some of the greatest uh, impact, again, for this organization over the years. So, Yeah, this company would not be the company it is today had I not really utilized and leaned in to the talents and the energies of, of those original team members. Um, we took on several contracts with Bank of America, and, and I'm proud to say that since 2003, TTC Innovations has had Bank of America as a client. Um, and, and I think it speaks volumes to the quality of the people and the trust that, that Bank of America can have in our organization and our team members. Um, because we have a group of people who truly care about the outcomes for the learners. And that's where the focus has always been. Mm -hmm. um, Bank of America was a great partner and um, they were using a tool called Knowledge at the time. 
when we first started contracting with them for their e-learning. And so you would create these modules in Knowledgent. Um, and Bank of America was such a good partner that they actually in a, in arranged for Knowledgent to deploy the tool on our server at Technically Training. Really? At the time, Technically Training. Mm -hmm, they installed it on our server because you had to build the training mm. on the tool. And so I would have our technology developers would VPN to the server in my basement. <laughs> <laughs> Connection was horrible. <laughs> They, they were. I could see them working on the screen, and it was just a mess. <laughs> so um, funny. But one of the pieces of Knowledgent was this tool called Virtual Customer, and the bank had adopted this tool for e-learning specifically for Virtual Customer because it gave them an opportunity to take a recording of an audio of a, of a phone conversation. And, ha and then program a simulation of the system. Hmm. And so it was kind of uh, one of those very early stage simulation tools. So you had to go in and to all of these triggers in the virtual customer system. Wow. And this is how Dana came back to become part of our team. Um, I had had her do a couple of other page layout things for me, um, but that was really small and there wasn't a lot of work. But virtual customer gave me a reason to really embed her and, and have the opportunity to work with her a lot. And because it was on my server, it was actually easier for her to come to my house and work on on the server directly. So that's when she started coming to work <laughs> with me a couple of days a week and she would do programming and virtual customer. She self-taught. Wow. <clears throat> to build in virtual customer. I mean, the tool was just a, a, a pretty <laughs> clunky system, but it worked, yeah. you know, it created the training, it worked. Well, I think some of the um, best uh, origin stories for companies, uh, a, a lot of what makes them so impactful, so successful, is that you get to work with your friends often. Exactly, so you, you get to choose. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I really, I, I had my brothers working for me. Um, my youngest brother still works for for the company as one of our contractors. He, he, you know, he, he's the kind of guy that you give him a online tool or something, he'll figure it out. <laughs> and so, you know, throwing different tools at him, he was like, great. And he'd figure out how to use them and build solutions. So he's, he's been our, one of our web, at the time it was web learning and now <laughs> e-learning. Um, he's been our, that with us since really the beginning. Mm -hmm. He was one of our first technology team members. So it's, it's been as this journey. So it was a very small group of us to begin with. And in 2003, um, that's really when we became a company. And, you know, that first year, we, if you take the dollars from April to April, which is kind of when we had our first funds come in. Um, from April to April that first year, we brought we had $700,000 in sales. Oh my gosh. I, I had no idea because <laughs> Lori had shared with me, like their, I think their biggest year many years ago had been around 700000 She said that the average year was three hundred to 500000 wow, So that is absolutely <laughs> incredible. It was that moment in time, though, because if you think about that time period, that's when e-learning really hit web off. Web-based training yep. at the time, um, but it was really becoming quite a thing, and companies didn't have internal resources <laughs> who could do that. So at the end of that first fiscal cycle, we had a seven hundred thousand dollars in business, <laughs> and the and then one year later, we were over the million dollar mark. Oh my so, gosh! Well, and I would have never guessed that. Right. <clears throat> So I think that that is an incredible place for us to stop. You have the players all in line. You've got a successful first fiscal year. The road is laid out in front of you guys. And I think that this is a great place for us to maybe take this to a part two, where we go into that second year um, and some of the trials and tribulations, some of the things that you learned, uh, some of the failures maybe, and of course the successes that led to a very successful second year. So uh, for this podcast, I just want to thank you, Debbie, for coming on. We will continue this conversation uh, because the story 
Well, it's never ending, uh, ultimately. So we'll get into a little bit more about the history of the company, and then we'll talk some more about what the actual state of the company is right now, some of the exciting things uh, mm-hmm. that you have to share for us uh, about the current state and then the future of what TTC is going to look like. So again, thank you so much for being our first guest here um, and couldn't be happier with, with sharing this moment with you. Oh, thank you. This has been so much fun. I, it's, it's funny to remember all of those moments. So I appreciate you <laughs> listening to my stories. Of course. You're a great storyteller. So uh, we want to make sure that we can capture that and, and gift this story to the world. Tune in to part two to get the rest of the story of Debbie Woldridge and her growth as a CEO and entrepreneur. For more great insights, join our newsletter, The Buzz, to keep up with what's trending in the ever-changing world of learning and development. Catch new episodes every week, like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and I'll see you next time.